The subject of my presentation aligns well, I hope, with the theme of this year's conference, History Makers in South Dakota. 63 years ago, in 1960, Benjamin Ben Rifle became the state's first, and to this date only, American Indian congressperson, making his election by the voters of South Dakota's first congressional district a legitimately historic event. Had Rifle not served in Congress from 1961 to 1971, he might still have been worthy of the title South Dakota history maker, for it is likely that if not President Kennedy or President Johnson before him, President Richard Nixon would have named Ben Rifle the Commissioner of Indian Affairs, a position he would hold briefly in the transition period between the presidencies of Gerald Ford and Jimmy Carter. I would submit that beyond his professional accomplishments, and there are many, it is Ben Rifle's symbolic significance, his emblematic prominence, that sets him apart from most other South Dakota history makers. We've, re we've resigned ourselves, I fear, to two-dimensional depictions of indigenous South Dakotans that to a degree are products of the state's newspapers and television and radio corporations. On the one hand, reservation residents are routinely depicted as drummers, dancers, bead workers, quilt makers, religious traditionalists, and political activists fighting to defend traditional lands. On the other hand, indigenous South Dakotans are depicted as victims, victims of historical forces, victims of boarding school abuses, victims of a reservation culture of alcoholism, drug abuse, dysfunctional schools, deplorable healthcare institutions, overburdened law enforcement agencies, gang activities, rising crime, and child neglect. What is missing is a third dimension. The stories of indigenous Americans who don't fit neatly into the repetitive, often predictable storyline of the cultural traditionist on the one hand, the victim of historical and social circumstances on the other. There are, or have been after all, indigenous vice presidents of the United States, indigenous congresspersons and cabinet secretaries, indigenous CEOs of large corporations, indigenous astronauts, indigenous fighter pilots, indigenous Olympic athletes, indigenous NFL quarterbacks, major league baseball players, and division one college basketball players, indigenous novelists and short story writers, indigenous college professors and architects, indigenous police officers who work in urban settings, and indigenous movie actors who don't always play the role of an indigenous character. There are countless stories of American Indians, let alone Dakota, Nakota, and Lakota peoples, whose inspiring life journeys and personal and professional triumphs occurred off the reservation. Yet sadly, those stories are told infrequently and almost always is an exception to the two-dimensional interpretation of American Indian life broadcast through publishing houses or through media, including our own South Dakota media. Ben Rifle is arguably South Dakota's best symbol, best emblem, if you will, of a third dimension of American Indian life. In one sense, Ben Rifle was an uncomplicated, predictable, and unassuming individual. During the 1930s, and for much of the 1940s, Rifle, though a promising official within the ranks of the Bureau of Indian Affairs, was nonetheless the consummate civil servant, the man in the gray flannel suit, if you will, who during his sometimes mundane duty assignments wore the hats of an agricultural extension agent, school superintendent, social worker, hospital manager, road superintendent, juvenile delinquency officer. This list, by the way, is a list of what Ben did as a as a civil servant with the BIA in 22 years of service. Translator, police chief, guidance counselor, career counselor, armed forces recruiter, financial consultant, consultant to tribal governments, et cetera, et cetera. 
In addition to being the multi-hatted civil servant in the gray flannel suit, Rifle was a conservative family man, husband to his Norwegian-American wife, Alice, and their daughter, Lois. This is Thanksgiving 1946, by the way, in North Dakota. Though bound by the provisions of the Hatch Act from involving himself in partisan politics while a civil servant, Rifle was a closet Republican of the Robert Taft, Dwight Eisenhower, Richard Nixon mold. Rifle's heroes were Benjamin Franklin and Abraham Lincoln, and he was a joiner of groups and perfectly comfortable among Rotarians, JCs, Boy Scout troop leaders, and Kiwanis Club members. Conversely, Rifle was a surprisingly complex man. He was bilingual, thoroughly fluent in Lakota, his first language. He did not live off the Rosebud Sioux Reservation, nor explore the outside world until he was 19 years old, after which, for all practical purposes, he was never again a reservation resident. Though an authority on Lakota history and cultural traditions, he was, by the 1950s, an integrationist who was urging reservation residents of the Northern Plains to migrate to urban areas with job opportunities. He ran for Congress as a Republican in a district with only 4,000 Indian voters, and he won the race because of his understanding of the agricultural economy and his grasp on the issues confronting small-town South Dakotans which was as great or greater than his white opponent. He was fiercely proud of his Lakota heritage, but resolute in his commitment to a future when more American Indians lived off reservations and when Indian reservations themselves, in, in, in Rifle's vision, would be confined to a bygone and unhappy chapter of American history. Significantly, Rifle was unapologetic about his vision of North American Indian life. He harbored no regret about his controversial belief that most American Indians would live better lives off the reservation. He lived his life without reservation. His vision was a world without reservations. Rifle envisaged a world without reservations, or at least without the poverty-oppressed reservations that characterize Indian life on the Northern Plains. Quote, this is Ben, a reservation is fast becoming just a place where some Indians were born. The United States is the Indian citizen's reservation today, unquote. Whether it was during his 22-year career with the Bureau of Indian Affairs, his decade in the U.S. House of Representatives, or his retirement at a moment when American Indian militants were seeking to upend the political and economic order in Indian country, Rifle insisted that the material, physical, and spiritual well-being of many American Indians would never improve by their remaining on reservations. Their voluntary segregation on reservations as a means of rekindling and preserving traditional Indian culture was, Rifle asserted, an enterprise doomed to fail. Again, Rifle was genuinely proud of his heritage. As noted, he was a fluent Lakota speaker, and while serving in Congress, he telephoned a relative in Mission, South Dakota, on a weekly basis to stay practiced in his native tongue. Though Rifle counseled his congressional colleagues to be patient with the slow pace of change in Indian country, he maintained that American Indians must incorporate mainstream institutions, practices, and values into their worldview, and eventually migrate off the reservation. Only then, he argued, would they restore themselves as a vital American subculture with the potential to shape, rather than be shaped by, historical forces. More than any other American Indian leader of his day, Ben Rifle drew attention to the cultural attitudes that, in his opinion, were strangling the economic development of reservation Indians on the Northern Plains. First and foremost, he declared, Indian reservations were psychologically confining. Reservation borders acted like cultural Berlin walls, trapping their residents in a pre-modern frame of mind 
that conserved values, practices, and traditions that were grossly incompatible, he believed, with modern democratic institutions, with the free market, with the rewards of public education, the nuclear family, and individual initiative. Customs and practices that had once been essential to a nomadic Buffalo culture lifestyle were now extraneous and unsuitable to survival in a, mo survival in a modern technical society. The persistence of old conventions, he argued, from generation to generation, did not necessarily assure cultural subsistence. On the contrary, Rifle argued, the persistence of the old ways across generations contributed to the social and economic decline that marred some Indian societies. Sadly, reservations were, in some cases, not preserving Indian culture, they were hatching a hybrid culture that entwined tradition with trends associated with urban ghettos. Excessive unemployment, destructive alcohol and drug abuse, juvenile delinquency, gang violence, high teenage pregnancy rates, excessive single parent families, child abuse, and child neglect. Rifle's unvarnished assessment of Indian country was controversial enough during his lifetime. It's probably more so today. Ironically, Rifle loved to boast about the adaptability of the Northern Plains Indians. He believed that his people, the Lakota, were the most adaptable people in American history. He said this over and over in public remarks, the most adaptable people in American history. Consider this, he would tell audiences. The Lakota once inhabited the woodlands of the Great Lakes region. They were pushed out of their homeland by Ojibwe's armed with muskets. They migrated to a completely new environment, the treeless, semi-arid Great Plains grasslands. Once there, they reinvented themselves. They fashioned a new economy shaped by the bison. They learned to ride, raid, and raise horses. They reconfigured their social and political orders. They conceived a new religion with the sun and new holy sites at its core. They modernized their military culture. They defeated their enemies. They built an empire. In some reasoned rifle, the Lakota accommodated new historical and environmental circumstances and thrived. Modern American Indians, he insisted, must undergo a new phase of adaptation and accommodation. They must adopt the white man's time, work, savings formula into their everyday lives. They should aspire to a fuller integration into American society, though not an integration that would compel them to sacrifice their racial identity or their personalities. After all, Rifle reminded his audiences, Norwegian Americans didn't renounce their Norwegianness by joining the mainstream, nor Irish Americans their Irishness, nor German Americans their Germanness, nor Mexican Americans their Mexicanness, etc. Ben Rifle never referred to himself as an American Indian or a Native American. He was, he told audiences and reporters, an Indian hyphen American, an Indian American, a hyphenated American. He counted himself luck lucky to have been acculturated into the melting pot that colored the fabric of American life. The American Indian experience was unique in American history, but not so unique, Rifle argued, that it inhibited American Indians from dissolving into the melting pot of races and ethnicities that make the United States in some ways unique in the world. One need not renounce his or, her, his or her Indian heritage to enjoy the benefits of integrated living. Ben Rifle was born near Parmalee, South Dakota, on the Rosebud Sioux Indian Reservation on September 19, 1906. His mother, that's Lucy, his mother with his daughter, Lois. His mother, Lucy Burning Breast, was a full-blood Lakota. His father, William Shorty Rifle, was a German-American 
who moved to the reservation at the invitation of his brother, John Rifle, one of the earliest teachers of the Brule Sioux tribe. William and Lucy met at a get-together at the Whipple Ranch, began courting, and were married in 1905. The rifle's, rifle's oldest child, Ben, was raised in infancy by his mother and maternal grandmother, from whom he learned the Lakota language and life ways. Ben did not begin speaking English until age five. After earning an eighth grade diploma at age 16, he appeared destined to join his father as a farmer rancher on the Rosebud Reservation. But when Ben turned 19, several former teachers and BIA officials urged his parents to allow him to earn his high school diploma at a seasonal school managed by South Dakota State College in Brookings. They agreed, his parents agreed, and because they did, history was made. Ben earned his high school diploma in three instead of four years. He was admitted to South, South Dakota State College in 1928 at a time when very few American Indians were attending four-year colleges and universities. Yet his minority status did not prevent him for, from becoming what can only be described as the big man on campus. Rifle won scholarships in chemistry and dairy science. He won admittance to the ROTC program and was commissioned as a second lieutenant in the United States Army. He would retire, by the way, as a lieutenant colonel in the United States Army Reserves. During his junior year, Ben was selected the student body president of South Dakota State College. Remarkable that an American Indian would be named the student body president at a land-grant college in the 1930s. He became the first, and I believe to this day, the only American Indian to lead the Hobo Day Parade, which is the largest one-day event in South Dakota. <laughs> and a fun time. <laughs> Rifle was voted most representative senior. He married a classmate, Alice Johnson, a Norwegian American. Rifle served in the BIA from 1933 to 1960. Some of the highlights of his civil service tenure included his authorship of the Oglala Sioux and Rosebud Sioux Constitutions, the ratifications of which were made possible because of Rifle's ability to translate complex concepts from the Western political tradition and the US Constitution for the leaders of the two tribes many of whom could not read or speak English. From 1946 to 1955, Rifle served as BIA superintendent at the Fort Berthold and Pine Ridge reservations, and I cannot conceive of two more challenging or difficult assignments, the details of which I will discuss in a moment. Rifle earned a PhD in public administration from Harvard University. He is believed to be the first American Indian to receive a doctorate from Harvard University. Though analytical and thoroughly researched, Rifle's PhD dissertation was ultimately a practical plan for relocating hundreds of members of the three affiliated tribes displaced by the Garrison Dam and Reservoir Project. Furthermore, his dissertation can be appreciated as a prophetic warning about the effects of overpopulation on Northern Plains Indian reservations. In 1956, Rifle became the BIA area director for the states of North Dakota, South Dakota, and Nebraska, a grooming position, if you will, that would have made him a leading candidate for BIA commissioner. But in 1960, Brown County Republicans approached him and asked him if he would run, if he would consider a run for Congress the first district seat being vacated by George McGovern as McGovern made a bid to defeat Carl Munt for a U.S. Senate seat. Rifle defeated Ray Fitzgerald in 1960 by outworking him on the campaign trail where the Republican convinced voters that his commitment to Indian affairs would not interfere with his responsibilities as the delegate of East River farmers and small business owners. In 
He fought to protect the South Dakota grain, beef, dairy, and poultry industries, mastered the issues surrounding South Dakota water development, and worked tirelessly to establish an East River sugar beet factory. Um, at that time in South Dakota, Belle Fouche was the home of a sugar beet factory. And uh, Rifle's goal was to get a factory built in East River, which would have required more acres to be, uh, the, the, the Department of Agriculture to allow more acres and sugar beets to be grown in South Dakota, which they did not. And hence, we do not have a sugar beet industry in the state, whereas North Dakota, Minnesota, Montana, Nebraska, as you know, all do have sugar beet factories. It was a bitter defeat for him, his worst legislative defeat, not being able to get a sugar beet factory in the state. He was a powerful spokesman and a, long, a lifelong supporter of the National Endowments for the Arts and the Humanities. Working with the office of Carl Munt, following the senator's debilitating stroke in 1969, Rifle helped the city of Sioux Falls win its bid to locate the Eros Data Center in Minnehaha County. In the realm of Indian Affairs, Rifle leveraged his seat on the House Appropriations Committee to win funding for the building of new schools in Sisseton and Todd County. That's the groundbreaking at the Sisseton High School. Sisseton and Todd County, where gymnasiums were and remain to this day, as far as I know, dedicated to Ben Rifle. I used to play basketball in Todd County's Ben Rifle gym, so I'm assuming it's still, it's, it's still, it's still, okay, good. And went to some boxing matches in there as well. I was not in the boxing matches, by the way. He was a vocal proponent of the Indian Civil Rights Act. His expert testimony before congressional committees being a critical element of the act's eventual adoption. Rifle's long yet remarkably eloquent 1965 floor speech on the state of Indian country was lauded by Republicans and Democrats alike. In that speech, Rifle, true to his personal history of straddling two cultures, urged patience in the modernization of Indian reservations while promising his legislative colleagues that he would remain steadfast in his efforts to promote Indian education and the better integration of American Indians into the social mainstream. In retirement, Rifle served as a historian for the National Park Service, during which time he researched and wrote about the histories of the indigenous peoples who once lived on national park properties. President Nixon named Rifle the chairman of the National Capital Planning Commission. Rifle was a political consultant to the Eastern Band of Cherokees, helped the Eastern Band of Cherokees write their constitution. He was a founding member of the American Indian National Bank and the South Dakota Art Museum. In fact, the South Dakota Art Museum's initial um, collection of American Indian artifacts was Ben's private collection. He was a national leader of the Boy Scouts of America. He received a national award at the same time that Hank Aaron, my boyhood hero, received a national award. They were both in the room at the same time receiving an award for their work with the Boy Scouts of America. In 1976, an old friend from his congressional years, President Gerald Ford, named Rifle the Commissioner of Indian Affairs, a post he held briefly under Ford's successor, Jimmy Carter, being sworn in as Commissioner of Indian Affairs there. Rifle remained a sought-after commentator on Indian affairs. In several newspaper interviews, Rifle criticized the Red Power Movement and its leading activist organization, the militant American Indian Movement, or AIM. AIM's separatist ideology and the group's renunciation of mainstream institutions undercut, in Rifle's view, the political, social, and economic gains being made by Northern Plains tribes since the 1930s. Rifle continued to exhort American Indians not to retreat from modern living, but to embrace modern living in a way that would allow them to enjoy and benefit from the values of both modern and pre-modern cultures. In 1989, during his trip to South Dakota to celebrate the state's centennial, President George H.W. Bush, another friend of Rifle's from their years together in the House of Representatives, singled out Rifle for praise. Rifle died on January 2nd, 1990, 
Honorary pallbearers at his funeral in Sioux Falls included Gerald Ford and Robert Bob Dole. There were several defining moments in Rifle's career with the BIA. I'll share a couple. His assignment to North Dakota's Fort Berthold Agency in 1946 coincided with the Army Corps of Engineers ramming through the Garrison Dam and Reservoir Project, making what was an already traumatic situation the forced displacement of over 300 Fort Berthold families by reservoir waters, much worse. Rifle inherited a terrible situation in 1946. Corps officials had bullied and insulted tribal members. But he made the best of the circumstances by working tirelessly with the Tribal Business Council to humanely relocate agency offices and schools, churches, cemeteries, and the Arikaras, Hidatsas, and Mandan people themselves. Rifle came of age during his stint at Pine Ridge from 1954 to 1955, where, for the first time, South Dakota's non-Indian community took note of his exceptional oratory skills. Ben was five foot nine, about 175 pounds, had a beautiful baritone voice, a sonorous baritone voice, slightly raspy from his lifelong habit of smoking. Whether speaking to business, civic, or educational groups, or to Lakota audiences, Rifle urged the acculturation and integration of American Indians. Rifle could be especially demanding on the men of the Pine Ridge Reservation. Quote, these are his, these are his words. If Red Cloud or Crazy Horse were to return to life and witness the neglect with which so many Lakota fathers treated their families, they would be ashamed, unquote. Rifle took steps to enhance law enforcement on the Pine Ridge Reservation and made attendance at reservation schools a top priority, as he did the voluntary relocation of Oglala families off the reservation and into communities with employment opportunities and integrated schools. But of greatest consequence were his urgings in both languages that reservation residents confront the socioeconomic realities of Northern Plains Indian reservations. Northern Plains reservations existed in semi-arid environments suitable for a ranching economy, but such an economy could not support large populations. Reservation overpopulation, he argued, stifled the development of reservation economies and assured that reservation schools, clinics, hospitals, courts, and social services would remain overwhelmed and substandard. Over his career, Rifle devoted untold hours to trying to improve the education of Indian youth. He favored biracial, integrated public schools rather than the all-Indian schools that dotted Indian country. Rifle's preference for school integration stemmed from his belief that most American Indians were only partial, his words, not mine, most American Indians were only partial American citizens who lacked the aptitudes, habits, and resourcefulness necessary to enjoy the fruits of full citizenship. Unless they became inculcated, his word, not mine, unless they became inculcated to Euro-American institutions and practices, Indians would remain slaves to their circumstances. In integrated schools, Indian youth, rubbing shoulders on a daily basis with white students both in and out of the classroom, would be exposed to and inspired by the competitive conventions of mainstream society. The achievements of the individual Indian student, whether in the classroom, in athletic competition, or in extracurricular events, in addition to boosting his or her confidence, would demystify the world of the whites, who despite the racists among them, were generally, Rifle argued, good and colorblind people who respected anyone who showed up to work on time, worked hard, and spent their money wisely. In 1960, Rifle told a reporter with the Minneapolis Star Tribune, I struggle to find page 141 here. When an Indian, these, these are Rifle's words, 
When an Indian is dressed and acts presentably, I don't know where he might go that he would be discriminated against, unquote. The radicalization of Indian politics was a decade off. So Rifle had yet to encounter, quote, the animosity reservation Indians sometimes showed toward the white Indian who was made good, unquote. Rifle moved comfortably between two cultures, and his Indian heritage, he confessed, probably enhanced his electability to public office. Quote, when it might have been an element, I think it helped. Club women would say they were voting for me because they felt I could help the Indian problem, unquote. Rifle was a strong proponent of the voluntary relocation of reservation Indians. A leading objective of federal Indian policy in the 1950s and early 1960s was the voluntary relocation of unemployed reservation residents to job-rich American cities. Rifle endorsed the relocation policy and went to great lengths to promote it on reservations in North Dakota, South Dakota, and Nebraska. The success rate of relocation was about 60%, meaning about 60% of the people who left the reservation and migrated off the reservation remained off the reservation and did not return. But the most significant and encouraging result of relocation was its effect on second generation relocatees. The children of relocated Indians were introduced to modern living in integrated schools. Many ultimately integrated into the economic, social, and political fabric of cities like Los Angeles, San Francisco, Oakland, Denver, Chicago, and Minneapolis. The offspring of relocated Indians became physicians, dentists, attorneys, engineers, small business owners, police officers, teachers, accountants, even school board presidents. They did so not by renouncing their tribal ties or their racial heritage, but by adopting the necessary rules of society that all Americans, regardless of their race or ethnicity, must adopt and follow. One could, as Rifle routinely demonstrated, straddle two cultures, enjoying and benefiting from the best of both cultures. Which brings me back to my focus on the symbolic significance of Ben Rifle. A South Dakota history maker who embodied integrated Indian life by questioning the alleged rewards of reservation life. Simply put, Rifle envisioned a world without reservations. Rifle was not so gullible as to believe that reservations would eventually disappear. Nor did he believe that, even if poverty-ridden reservations did somehow dissolve as features of the American landscape, the gap between Indians and non-Indians would suddenly close. Nevertheless, Rifle did not want American Indians defined by reservations. More than just tracts of land or political units, reser reservations were, in his opinion, cultural confinements that held back their occupants. To break free of their mental confinement, Rifle urged Indians should imagine their lives without reservations. He had learned to do so, and the consequence was not just his materially improved condition, but a fulfilling life wherein he preserved the American Indian identity while enjoying the fruits of American citizenship. It was in this spirit that at his funeral, Rifle's great niece, Gail Teachout Hare, asked American Indians to reflect on the teachings of her great uncle. Quote, I think if Indian people stopped and seriously considered what he said all his life, our lives would be easier by following his suggestions. Unquote. I'll end my presentation by sharing with you several conversations I had with university students from North Dakota and South Dakota reservations in attendance at conferences or book festivals where I was speaking to audiences about the legacy of Ben Rifle. In all but one occasion, the university students I spoke with, and they included budding computer scientists, nurses, teachers, social workers, they idolized Rifle, who, like themselves, was a reservation resident that sought opportunity off the reservation. 
The students' admiration for Rifle was genuine and I believe self-affirming. They viewed Rifle as a role model, a trailblazer, a success story. It's my observation that they appeared relieved to have an inspiring American Indian role model who displayed a fierce pride in his tribal heritage, but was equally fierce in his determination to live life on his own terms, to not allow non-Indians to characterize him, define him, stereotype him, or pigeonhole him as a reservation Indian, unquote. It appears that Ben Rifle, who incorrectly concluded that his name would be forgotten and his achievements overlooked, has become, at least among some young South Dakotans, a potent symbol of the 21st century American Indian, at liberty to do whatever she or he chooses, bound by nothing, capable of anything, free to pursue his or her dream, off the reservation and without reservation. Thank you very much.